You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Hello, and welcome to episode 361 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Today, July 4, 2023, marks the 247th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, and the United States has declared independence from Great Britain. In just three short years, we will celebrate a large milestone. 2026 will mark the 250th anniversary of the United States' birth as an independent nation. Now, as you might expect, historic sites and museums across the United States are working hard to plan special programs to help all Americans celebrate, commemorate, and remember the American Revolution. They're also planning activities that will cause us to reflect on how we would like to use the ideas and ideals of the founding generation to propel the United States forward in its grand experiment as a constitutional republic. Now, historians have also been thinking about and discussing 2026 for several years. What are historians thinking and conversing about as it relates to 2026? What would they like to see from their fellow Americans as we commemorate this big anniversary? We have convened our own panel of historians to answer these questions. The historians we will meet all study the American Revolutionary Era, and they all study it from different perspectives. Lindsay M. Chervinsky studies the American Revolution from the vantage point of early presidential history. Once independence was secured, how did the revolution and the ideas put forth in the Declaration of Independence manifest themselves into the United States Constitution and the government it established. That's what Lindsay thinks about. Ronald Angelo Johnson is a diplomatic historian who investigates the American Revolution within the broader age of revolutions that the American Revolution helped to begin. And Carrie Ann Akemi Yakota is a cultural historian who studies the revolution from an international perspective. Her expertise in early American history, material culture, and ethnic studies adds to our understanding of the revolution and what the revolution has and does mean for all Americans. Now, during our conversation, our guest historians will reveal how they define and think about the American Revolution as an event, why historians are advocating for an inclusive and accurate history of the American Revolution for 2026, and how our guests are thinking about the legacy of the American Revolution nearly 250 years later. But first, happy 4th of July. This episode is just one piece of a multimedia event that the Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios has created for you. So be sure to stay tuned for my in-episode announcement about the video, blog post, and teacher materials that my colleagues and I have created for you. And with that, let's go meet our guest historians. Joining us, we have three guests. Lindsay M. Chervinsky is a presidential historian. She's a regular contributor to publications such as The Wall Street Journal, Ms. Magazine, CNN, and Time Magazine. She's the author of The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution, which you may recall from episode 279, and her forthcoming book will investigate the presidency of John Adams. Ronald Angelo Johnson is an award-winning historian who is an associate professor and the Ralph and Bessie May Lynn Chair of History at Baylor University. He's the co-editor of the Journal of the Early American Republic and the author of Diplomacy in Black and White, John Adams, Toussaint Louverture, and their Atlantic World Alliance, which we discussed in episode 52. And finally, we have Carrie Ann Akemi Yakota, who is an associate professor of history at the University of Colorado, Denver. Carrie Ann's research expertise is in colonial and early American history, trans-Pacific history, and American studies. A cultural historian, Carrie Ann's first book, Unbecoming British, How Revolutionary America Became a Post-Colonial Nation, investigates early Americans' creation of a new American identity. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Lindsay, Ron, and Carrie Ann. Hey. Thanks so much for having us. Now, the reason we've gathered today is because for years, we historians have been talking about 2026, which is the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution and the United States' independence. And when we've been talking about 2026, it's how we historians would like our fellow Americans to commemorate this very important event. So 
I'd like that to be our topic for today's conversation. What are historians thinking about in 2026 or for 2026? What kind of conversations are we having? And how do we want our fellow Americans to remember the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution? So let's start by talking about the American Revolution as an event. How do you define the American Revolution? Do you see it as a political event, an economic event, a military event, or something else? Lindsay, maybe we could start with you. How do you define the American Revolution? Well, I'm sure if you asked 100 historians, you'd get 105 answers. So I think that it is an attempt to create a new identity, to create a civic identity, a cultural and national identity at a time when there were a couple of options available to people that lived in the 18th century world. You could have a national identity based on a king or a queen, based on an ethnicity or a religion or a nation state. And I think that the revolutionaries or the colonists or the new Americans, whatever we want to call them, were trying to define something other. And the struggle was, how do you do that in juxtaposition to where they had come from? So that encompasses, of course, military conflict to sort of enforce that new identity, economic turbulence as they disentangled the relationships that they had relied upon. And of course, a political movement to try and articulate and define what that new identity was going to be. Carrie Ann, some of Lindsay's response speaks to some of your work in Unbecoming British. You looked at how Americans after the revolution created a new identity. So do you think about the American Revolution similarly to Lindsay? How do you think about the American Revolution as an event? Yes, absolutely. I mean, in my work, I look at the revolution as the first rather than the final step on this long road to independence from Great Britain. And it was clear in doing my research that while their victory in the Revolutionary War granted Americans formal political freedom, the colonists remained economically, intellectually, and culturally dependent on the mother country for generations. And I thought that was very interesting because the way this narrative is usually told and presented to students in the classroom is that this is really the beginning of something new. And while I acknowledge that that is true, I'm also thinking about the waning of this former colonial world. And that's why I'm using, in a tongue-in-cheek manner, but this idea of having to unravel or unbecome colonials before Americans can set about developing a new nation. And how about you, Ron? You're known for studying the Long Revolution, the Age of Revolutions, which took place between 1775 and 1848, or roughly between the American Revolution and the start of the Second French Republic. With your long view of revolutions, how do you define the American Revolution? Yeah, I really like Lindsay and Carrie Ann's understanding around identity. And, and when I think about the American Revolution, I think about it as a coming together of communities. You have these very disparate groups of people from Savannah, Georgia to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and every place in between. You have rural folks, you have commercial interests all coming together, but they don't come together in a very linear way, right? There's a lot of debate, they're back and forth, there are a lot of disagreements. I'm the last sibling in a very large family. And so I identify readily with the American Revolution over time because it is about, okay, this is who we are. But there are multiple understandings and interests about where I fit into this we. And you see that playing out across the American Revolution. And I'm just so fascinated by the ways in which through letters, through congresses, through letters to the editor and back and forth, there's this moment where they decide we're going to do this together. But even over the next hundred years, they find ways to be themselves out of this moment. These are all really great points and aspects of the American Revolution that I study. Culture, identity, how do you get people who are from really disparate communities to come together and act as one? But when I think about the American Revolution, and I love the revolutionary period, and I think why I love this period so much is that it is such a complex and multifaceted event. And really, depending on when and where you look at the American Revolution, you will see moments where it's a political event and other moments where it's an economic event and still other moments 
where it's a military event. There's the war for independence that goes with this. But ultimately, if I take a really large view, what I see as a constant throughout the American Revolution and revolutionary America is that this was an event, this was a time about power. It's a time when Americans were asking, who gets the power to set economic procedures and free trade agreements? Who gets the power to represent themselves in government and have a say in government? And then, of course, who has the power to go out and raise large numbers of troops and fight different armies? So it really is a very multifaceted event. I think there's so much good work being done on the internal dynamics in what becomes the United States. But what my work really is focusing on is the asymmetries of power that continue in the years following the Americans' victory in the American Revolution. So for me, that was very relevatory to look at how, even though Americans have won their political freedom, they are still economically, culturally, intellectually, and tied and dependent on the former mother country. I'm most interested in the Americans' relationship to Great Britain because of that post-colonial legacy. And my insights really are formed by the great work that's been done on post-colonial nations in later periods and in other parts of the country. And what struck me, we often, and I think to our peril, assume that for American elites in the founding generation, it was a seamless transition from colonial to citizen. And I don't agree that that's the case. I think that they really struggled to redefine their relationship to the mother country in a world where they were still dependent on the power of Great Britain and the other European colonial nations. I don't think you can have a discussion about the American Revolution without talking about power. Just a few decades ago, the American Revolution was considered an elite event because of the access to the papers of the elite founding members of that generation the access to newspapers where the elite would put their words out there for people to see. But one of the things we're seeing is that as this power by certain individuals being promulgated, there were others, particularly people of color, even the enslaved, understanding this is a moment where I can have access to power. I can find my way into these conversations. And as we progress as historians with different methodologies, with the advancement of technologies that make different sources available, we are seeing the ways in which members, not just of the elite founding generation, but members of across colonial America, across the Caribbean, really made their voices heard in that moment. Yeah, well, I just wanted to respond to what Carrie was saying about the ongoing process of trying to figure out what it meant to be a new nation. And that's something that I work on a lot in my own scholarship as I look at the early Republic period. And I really push back against the idea that we can study the revolutionary period and then draw a line. Because, of course, these are all the same people and they're living through the same things. And so as they're trying to create a new federal government, I know we're going to get into legacies more later, but as they're trying to create a new government and they're trying to figure out how to be leaders or officials or do any of those things, they are, of course, informed by the war that they just fought or the battles that they just saw. And they're trying to think about how to position themselves vis-a-vis the British system. And that's really the only comparison they have. So they're trying to create this American identity. And the only real way they can think to do it is in comparison to something else. And that process takes such a long time. So I completely agree that we really can't view the revolutionary period as 1767 to 1783. It has to be a much longer and broader process to actually look at the full scope of the evolution and its impacts and where it continues to evolve from there. I really like what Lindsay is saying there and this idea of a cutoff date. The thing I'm always fascinated by is many of the things that are happening across the revolution, these men and women are doing these for the first time. They're trying out different things. And what I really want us to think about as Americans is the ways in which they made mistakes. They tried things that did not work. And when it didn't work, they found something else. And I think that is a part of who the American Republic, who we are as Americans, of trying new things. When that doesn't work, we reward innovation by allowing people to correct mistakes. 
we as historians look at the revolution in so many different ways. And it struck me that when I was in grad school, we were often taught, if you're looking at the revolution from a political perspective, it's like there's almost a before and after. I think it's an easy way to narrate that story. But if you're diving into the archives and looking at the lives of the actual people who are living it, these are elite, these are the enslaved peoples, people who are in the lower socioeconomic orders. You see that for all of these individuals, it's not a before and after. And I'm a material culture scholar, and I found that using objects and images as our primary sources really did help me see a different perspective. Of course, as historians, we're known to be very textually oriented, and thus we tend to work most on the published texts of the elites. But the material culture perspective gave me a different insight. For instance, George Washington, in the midst of the battle to defend New York City from the British, he was writing to his loyalist China porcelain merchants trying to buy a new set of dinnerware. And he was taking time out because he thought it'd be important as the leader, hopefully of a free nation, if he was victorious, to present the Americans as a civilized society. And I don't find anywhere where Washington's writing, I miss the king, but you hear him lamenting about missing the accoutrements of British society, and as you see, the same with Jefferson. So I think looking at the material lives of the founding generation show us a different aspect where they define themselves as culturally British. And so they don't want to give up their legacies to things like British arts, culture, civility, and literature. And so I think we have to look at these different strands in studying this period that things like foodways don't change and culture don't change as readily as something like political status. I'd like to go back to what Lindsay and Ron were saying about a cutoff date for the American Revolution, but I'd like us to shift our conversation to a start date for the American Revolution. So as you know, I'm from Boston, and we started thinking about the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution with the 250th anniversary of the Stamp Act riot of 1765. So in 2015, we were celebrating Boston's Stamp Act riots. But a national committee came along and said, you know, if we're really going to look at celebrating, commemorating, and remembering the American Revolution, then we need to do that as a nation in 2026. And their logic is, is because that's the anniversary year of the Declaration of Independence, wherein the United States declared itself to be an independent nation. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about centering the United States' commemoration on the year 2026. Ron, are you comfortable with 2026? Do you see other years as being possible dates for us to consider and commemorate? I think 2026 is an appropriate date to commemorate the Declaration of Independence in 1776. I do not see that as the beginning of the revolution. I see it as a multi-year culmination of work that had been done since the very end of the Seven Years' War, the Treaty of Paris in 1763, and the Stamp Act, the Boston Massacre, the Tea Act. I mean, there's this step, right? And as I talked about earlier, this community building that took its time and was very one step forward, two steps back that 1776 kind of captures in that document. And it is a very important document. And I don't think it's necessary to understate that in any case. However, it is one moment in many moments. And as a diplomatic historian, I want to throw out 1778 as a year that I'd like people to give a little bit more thought to, because that was the year in which the Americans really began to understand their place in the larger world. Right after the Declaration of Independence, John Adams came up with this idea for diplomatic relations, and he had the model treaty. And he was really capturing the minds of Americans in 1776 that they had so much to offer the world that they could, at some level, dictate their relations with others. And Benjamin Franklin takes this treaty to Paris. And he realizes very quickly that there's a negotiation that is involved between nations, that the Americans, this young nation, this nation in making, has not fully understood. And what 1778 does, 
that alliance between France, without which, I argue, many people argue, the War of Independence would not have been won. But that moment is really a beginning of Americans negotiating with other people in the world. Yes, this is our idea for what we want. But what we find in diplomacy and negotiation, this is what is possible. And reality constantly illustrates that working with other nations, everyone does not always operate the way Americans would like. And I think 1778 is a beginning of that process in the American mindset. So we have one vote for 1778 and 2028. Lindsay, you study presidents and George Washington had his great military experience during the American Revolution. And John Adams, the subject of your forthcoming book, did have a hand in writing the Declaration of Independence, as well as participating in those negotiations that Ron just talked about. So what do you think about 2026 as a commemoration date? Do you think that is a good year that we should commemorate, or is there another year you'd like us to think about? Well, Ron is obviously speaking to my heart with his praise of John Adams, so I will absolutely applaud that argument. I think that the Declaration of Independence deserves commemoration, but I think it deserves commemoration for what it inspires later. The language takes on so much impact over time, and I think that that is a cumulative process rather than necessarily a turning point in 1776. I think it's important for the reasons that Ron just articulated, it's starting to lay down the conditions under which the United States can have relationships with other foreign nations. So for me, I really see the turning point more as 1775 and 2025, because I think when things like Lexington and Concord happen, and then the Continental Congress forms an army, they don't form an army to be like, let's be buddies with Great Britain. They form an army for a purpose. And they appoint George Washington, of course, as the commander in chief, and he goes up to Boston to join this army. And Nations around the world recognize that the conflict has begun, even if they haven't necessarily put the correct or the future terminology on top of what that conflict is going to be. There's a recognition that something is happening. And that doesn't mean, of course, that we can't recognize really pivotal points, I think, both before and after, and we should. But to me, that is, I think, the turning point when it can no longer go back to what it was and something new has to come out of it. And how about you, Carrie Ann? Your work focuses on trans-Pacific elements of the American Revolution and the Revolutionary Era. Do you have a date that you're thinking about that makes sense to mark the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution? I think I'm linking into some of the themes that both Lindsay and Ron have mentioned in terms of 1776 as being an appropriate date because it represents this culmination of other forces that have been building and which will continue to evolve and change in the years to come. I also want to link into the importance of international relations. And one of the most significant things that the victory in the American Revolution does for Americans is it allows them to go out into the wider world as their own separate political entity. And when I set about studying the formation of American national identity, I decided to do so by looking at sites that were outside of the boundaries of the nation state. So, for instance, one of my main areas of research is the early American China trade. So the date, I wouldn't say I would switch it out for 1776's date for commemoration, but I'd add it to our long program of celebration. And that would be February 22nd, 1784. It's a specific date, but it's a date that was important for many reasons. It was the inaugural voyage of the Empress of China, the first American vessel to travel to Canton out of New York Harbor. And on that very same day that the Empress set sail, the ship that was carrying the ratified Articles of Peace to London also departed. That date's also important because it was George Washington's birthday. So I think that's interesting. And when you look at the way that Americans gathered, it was a very frigid day and Americans are gathering along the harbor and cheering on the ship that's going to finally be able to go to China on its own because previously colonials who wanted refined goods from China had to buy them at a steep cost from British merchants under the mercantile laws. Philip Freneau writes 
he was a bad poet, but he's great for historians because he celebrates his day in prose saying that freedom from Bologna won, Americans going to meet the sun. So he's talking about this day as the moment of American glory. And I juxtapose that to the date the Empress sails into Wampoa Harbor in Canton, and it's met with complete silence. And although other nations or other places around the globe knew that Americans had won their freedom, that news apparently hadn't reached the merchants of Canton. So Americans were met with silence. It was a tiny ship. And they said, where's the big ship from the British East India Company? You know, where are they? And Americans had to articulate the differences between them and the British. And it was very hard. So this comes back to the point that I wanted to be sure to mention, which is that national identity really is a constructed entity that we, in every generation, were continuing to add to. So these American merchants had to explain what is the difference. And they said, well, you speak the same language, your names are the same, you look the same, and you even smell the same, which was not a good thing. So Americans had to really downplay similarities between themselves and the former mother country. And they had to exaggerate their differences. And one of the ways they did this was by showing a map and saying, this is the big country. And when they did that, they weren't just showing the East Coast. They were showing the entire continent, which foreshadows Americans' expansion into the rest of the West. Ron? There's no other place I think I can fit this into our conversation, but I want to give a little love to the Articles of Confederation in 1777, because they are often looked at as a failure. But I want to say that within a year of the Declaration of Independence, the delegates and the Americans realized we need a set of documents. We need a set of principles by which we all live. And those principles got them through the war. Those principles got them to the Treaty of Versailles in 1783. And the failure was that those articles were created in a wartime situation, and they could not bear the weight of a fully-fledged nation on the other side of it. And the Americans came to realize that, that this worked for as long as it worked, but now we need something more. But from the very beginning, or at least very many of this documenting of American government, there's been this understanding, there's a set of principles by which we all need to be able to live together. And I think that's a wonderful legacy. Yes, the Articles of Confederation faded, gave way to the Constitution, but it was a foundation upon which we've built ever since. As someone who is studying the creation and ratification of the Articles of Confederation, I really appreciate that love, Ron. And maybe we should throw out the anniversary of 2031 which is the 250th anniversary of when those 13 disparate colonies we've been talking about finally decided to come together as a union. And it wasn't just any union either, but a perpetual union. And they didn't state the type of union. They said in order to form a more perfect union in the Constitution, but in the Articles of Confederation, they explicitly say that this will be a perpetual union. So I find the whole process by which the Union of States comes together to be a very fascinating area of study. So thanks, Ron. Thank you for working the Articles of Confederation into our conversation. Now, Carrie Ann, Lindsay, Ron, and I have all been part of conversations at scholarly history conferences that demonstrate when it comes to 2026, historians disagree not just on what the definition of the American Revolution should be, but also what we should be talking about, who we should be talking about, where we should be talking about, or the different events and legacies that we should include in the revolution's 250th anniversary. So Carrie Ann, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about what historians are saying about who we should include and whose stories we should tell as we remember and commemorate and celebrate the American Revolution 250 years later. So I have been part of some of these conversations, and I think that the idea of inclusivity is very important, but what does that mean? And after being a part of many of these conversations, regardless of how you think this moment should be marked or commemorated, I think that we have to know that everyone's going to have different ideas. We can be in disagreement and we can have a robust debate about differences in how we interpret the past and how we celebrate the past in the present, but that doesn't take away from a sense of Americanness or unity 
but in fact, it strengthens the nation state. If we are able to have these disagreements without saying it's somehow anti-American, I really wanted to be sure to discuss the idea that differences do not mean that we are somehow breaking down the nation. I think one of the things that came out in this OAH conference was, you know, the sense of being critical. And then there was another side of people just saying, you know, we just want to celebrate. Can't we just have fun? How do we start to think about being able to be critical about who has been left out of these national celebrations and conversations without somehow being seen as taking down the nation? But in fact, this process of debate is strengthening the nation and is what we need as a people to move forward. And I think commemorations are about remembering the past, but equally important, maybe even a more important component of that is to plan for the future and to have aspirations and set goals for the future. That's what I hope we do in these upcoming years as we plan for this momentous occasion. I want to speak to this fear that somehow including people or groups or places somehow displaces others. And I don't see inclusion in that way. I see inclusion as really giving more texture and adding to an already good story. For example, in terms of including more African-American voices into the story. Prior to a few decades ago, that was very difficult to do because we were so connected to just the text, right? And as Carrie's work has demonstrated, by using objects, by using culture and other means, we're able to bring African-American soldiers into the story, women of color, poets, writers as participating in this bringing together of communities. Communities are not just geographical, they're racial, they're cultural, they're economical. And I think it tells us much more about who we are in this diverse society in which we live because the society in which the revolution was a diverse society. We talk about diversity as if it just showed up at some point in American history. My contention is the United States has been diverse from its infancy. And I think as we tell that story more, it gives us a better understanding of the ways in which the revolutionary members negotiated diversity with their faults and their failures, helps us understand that we're going to have faults and failures as we continue to grapple with diversity. And so I see inclusion as a benefit much more than any type of fear that we're going to somehow tear down the country or tear down someone's legacy. I see it as more of us really understanding better who we are from where we've come. Ron, I have a follow-up question for you. But first, Lindsay, we both went to the same conference where we talked about inclusive history. And the question came up, what about the founding fathers? Will they be remembered? Are we forgetting them or leaving them out so we can talk about the stories of more and different people? These were questions that even scholars were asking. So I wonder if you would tell us what your thoughts are on the founding fathers' place and role in the American Revolution's 250th anniversary. Yeah. So I think that one of the challenges, because the history field is sort of under siege from a lot of different factors, we are very poorly funded. We are struggling to have the resources that are required to do the work, to hire people, to have enough teachers in classrooms. And then those are just the financial factors. There are the cultural factors, there are the political factors. And so I think what that has produced a little bit is a sense of a zero-sum game about history. That if we talk about certain people, there's only a certain amount of breadth or bandwidth or mental capacity or time or money to share history. And to a certain extent, that is true. But I think that if we focus on it in that way, it's going to lead to this battle of if we spend X amount of days talking about these people, then we're going to not be able to spend time on these people. And I think that's the incorrect way to look at it. And I understand why we've kind of gotten there as a field because of the challenges we're facing. But especially as we're thinking about commemoration and we're thinking about speaking with public audiences about this event, and this event is very important to public audiences, we have to think of it as a rising tide lifts all boats. And the same is true with history. So 
if we are able to share a story about, let's say, John Adams, we can also find the ways in which he traveled across the world and we can incorporate Atlantic history and we can incorporate race and slavery and his exchanges and his experiences with different types of people and bring in women and material culture. And it shouldn't be one or the other. And the way we have to think about it is, where is someone coming to the table with a particular interest? If their interest is John Adams, use that to open the door and then introduce all these other things. If their interest is slavery, let's use that to start the conversation and then build that into a broader and wider framework. And if we can come at it, and I think what is a more generous way of looking at telling these stories, then we will be able to include all of the types of diversity that both Carrie Ann and Ron were talking about. And we should include those things, but we can do so in a way that doesn't feel destructive. I agree. This idea of bandwidth, or we may not have more time. When I think about the American Revolution, when I think about 1773, immediately the Tea Party jumps into all of our minds. And the Tea Party is a resistance action against what white American colonists felt as an improper imposition of the monopoly of tea. They're responding in December to the acts that were passed in May. In that same year, in that very same year, enslaved people in Massachusetts began petitioning for freedom to the Massachusetts government. These resistance actions by white colonists and by black colonists were happening in the same year at the same time. I just said that in about 12 seconds. It does not take a whole lot of time to tell these stories that were happening simultaneously in American history. It's an interesting idea using the founding fathers and these more traditional events like the Boston Tea Party and people's interest in these events and people as gateways to welcome more people into the history of the American Revolution. And then, as you say, Ron, it doesn't really take a lot of time to at least add a mention about others who played roles in the lives of these people we're talking about, in the events that we're talking about when we write books or give presentations that focus on different groups and single people like the Founding Fathers. Carrie Ann? Yeah, and I wanted to also mention the fact that I am working on interethnic relations between Asian Americans and African Americans specifically. It's a very unusual for a historian to go from the modern day to the past, but I wanted to make that leap because I wanted to show my students, many of whom are themselves immigrants, that the early republic, that revolutionary history, that the study of the founding fathers can also tell their story. And these are students of color, students who come from other places, refugees. I think the more we open historical investigation to students of all backgrounds, the better and more unique insights we are going to get as we study the past. For instance, when I'm looking at the Founding Fathers, I saw in them traits that reminded me of modern day immigrants and specifically Japanese American immigrants who were born citizens, but were imprisoned by their own nation. You know, these are citizens that were imprisoned during World War II because they were thought to be enemies because they were of Japanese origin. So how does that relate to the founding fathers? I saw the founding fathers in the colonial period trying to articulate and fight for their position as legitimate or full-fledged subjects of the British Empire and being told that by virtue of their birth in the savage wilds and environs of the colonies that they were second class. And I saw them articulate this in these feelings of insecurity, but yet wanting to support an entity that you feel 100% a part of through birth for some other reason that you can't control. You're always left out and you're always trying to fight your way in. So that's how the Founding Fathers became relevant to my life. And that's how I try to connect this version of them. They could be at the top of the social and economic hierarchy. They could be slaveholders in this domestic context. But from a worldwide stage, they're seen as very liminal players. And this brings my students who never thought they would take revolutionary history, that they somehow don't have to study that anymore because we won the rights to study ethnic studies, which you think is a great thing to have. But early American history belongs to every person here regardless of your citizenship status. But if you're part of this society, this could speak to you. 
And so I think that's important as we think about commemorating in 2026, that how do we make early American history relevant to all people? Ron, back to my follow up. Several minutes ago, you started to open up the conversation that early America was a diverse place right from the beginning. So how do you think we should be answering the claims that historians are just making up all of this diversity and that we should just be talking about the Continental Soldiers and the Founding Fathers and celebrating their accomplishments in 2026? That is a really, really good question. And I understand because we teach American history has been written from a predominantly white American perspective, that there's this notion that America was majority white. And Numerically, that was not the case. Particularly across the southern colonies, the majority of people in those colonies were people of color. West of the Mississippi, it's Native American and Spanish. It's a hugely diverse continent, and Europeans are a very small number in the grand scheme of things. But I don't see that as scary. I don't see that as demeaning. That's just a numerical fact. And so one of the ways in which I like just to think about that is not a hierarchy of people, right? Because I think that's where that comes from, because the enslaved people didn't have legal rights and they didn't count as much, but they added a lot to what America became. And I get that argument. The historians are making this up. The people at the time understood the importance of each individual within that milieu. Yes, they did not give everybody equal rights, but they understood those economies would not have worked without the enslaved people in the southern colonies and in the northern colonies, without the sailors who were treated very, very poorly. They understood all of these things at the time. The things that historians are writing about, in many cases, would not have been anything new for the people living at the time. I think it is becoming revelatory for American audiences because the stories are getting broader, the stories are getting deeper, and the stories are becoming more textured. I think that's to our benefit as historians. I take a great deal of pride in being a part of a community that really does try to capture as many voices as possible, but it doesn't take a whole lot of work. If you read the letters of the elite members of the founding generation. They're writing about the poor. They're writing about the enslaved. They're in there. It's just for whatever reasons, we've not been telling those stories today. When we talk about 2026 and the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, we use a lot of different words. Remembrance, commemoration, celebration. And I've heard people at the conferences that we've attended say, Can't we just celebrate 2026? So let's talk about this language right after we take a moment to hear from our episode sponsor. This year, our 4th of July special isn't just a special podcast episode. It's a multimedia event. Now that we're part of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, we're taking full advantage of our production capabilities by exploring the American Revolution from different perspectives. As you've heard, This episode features three guest historians with three different areas of expertise who are helping us investigate the American Revolution and what they and other historians think we should celebrate, remember, and commemorate during the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in 2026. The Colonial Williamsburg Digital Video Team has created a unique opportunity for you to meet Thomas Jefferson and Frederick Douglass. Thomas Jefferson offers his ideas about freedom and independence as he reads his Declaration of Independence while Frederick Douglass reads selections from his famed 1852 speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? Heard together, we can start to understand how Americans' ideas about freedom have changed over time and continue to change over time. Colonial Williamsburg has also posted a blog post on its website, written by her very own Holly White. In her post, Holly investigates the importance of looking at the histories of early America and the founding of the United States from multiple viewpoints. Holly highlights that it's only when we look at events from multiple perspectives that we can gain a fuller and more complete picture of what it was like to live and work in early America and how so many different people contributed to the formation and evolution of the United States. And finally, my colleagues at the Bob and Marion Wilson Teacher Institute at Colonial Williamsburg have teaching materials to accompany this video, blog post, and this podcast episode. You'll find links to our multimedia event on the show notes page. 
at benfranklinsworld.com slash 361. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash 361. When we talk about 2026 and the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, we're using a lot of different words. Remembrance, commemoration, celebration. And I think we should address why we're talking about 2026 as a remembrance, why we're talking about it as a commemoration, and why are we sometimes hesitant to say that what we really want to do in 2026 is celebrate? Lindsay, would you start us off? There's a quote that I think is attributed to John Adams that roughly one third of the nation were ardent patriots, one third were loyalists, and one third were totally ambivalent. And there's a lot of scholarship about the accuracy of that statement. But let's say roughly he was right. I think that concept really gets at this idea that it can't be purely celebration, but it also can't be purely commemoration. It was an incredibly complex moment to live through. There were people who understood that historic things were happening, but were just trying to figure out how to feed their families and get by and ignore or go underneath the radar of the violence and the destruction and the dislocation that was happening nearby. There were people who felt like their world was being torn apart because they wanted to remain loyal to the British Empire. And there were people who felt like they were fighting to establish a new world. And those people kind of won, and therefore their story has become the dominant narrative. And there are a lot of things that are really great about that narrative. As I mentioned earlier, the rhetoric of the Declaration of Independence went on to inspire and was employed by millions of people across the globe over the next two centuries to inspire their own movements for liberty and independence. And so we shouldn't in any way dismiss or diminish the power of that movement. But I do think it's actually more useful for us to think about it as this third, third, third concept as we're living in our own lives, recognizing that there's never been one idea about what it means to be an American or what it means to have a United States or what it means to have one type of people. There has always been this disagreement and this conflict. And if anything, like that's kind of the American way. To the question about celebration, commemoration and remembrance, I'm going to out myself as someone who is a big fan of historical films. I think anytime history makes its way into the film, I'm all in favor of it because that just means more people are going to be interested in what I do. And HBO did a really great series on John Adams. In that miniseries, when they are telling the story of the vote for independence, one of the things I love about that series is they go through the vote. And they call out the states or the colonies by individual. And they'll say, I abstain. And at the end of it, when they read the vote and they realize they just voted for independence, it's silent for a long time. And for me, like, that's the commemoration of, like, what was at stake? And then they go immediately to two days later to the 4th of July. And there's a celebration about what had just occurred. And I think those things go together. When I think about remembrance, I can't help but think that the importation of Africans for enslavement on the North American continent is going to increase after the Declaration of Independence, after the Constitution. And so there's a remembrance for many people about what could have been, about missed opportunities. But I think celebration, commemoration, and remembrance are all in order as we talk about 2026. Ron, you said it very well that it's all of these things. The problem when we're debating about how to mark these events, it's that there seems to be this continual historical amnesia. I always think it's dangerous when we hearken back to this moment when the United States was one entity. And as Ron, you've been saying, we've all been saying here, it's always been a diverse society. But somehow in moments of crisis or insecurity, it's always like people are hearkening back to this moment when all Americans knew who they were. It was a homogenous society. There was not these outliers. But in this early period, when German immigrants came and they decided to set up German language schools, they were seen by the founding generation as being very, very dangerous in ways that sound just like some of the more heated debates that we're having and seeing today. So there never was a moment when everybody looked the same, felt the same, 
So I think that's important. I also feel that this idea of how the revolutionary victory sets off a series of events that are less than positive for many different communities and peoples, Native Americans, and then later what happens to people who are living in what is then the Spanish colonies and later Mexico or the peoples of the Pacific Islands. So that's why I'm interested in thinking about how this moment sets off Americans across the globe. And this will have reverberations across the Pacific, across the Atlantic world. So those things are also important. But like Ron said, I'm also very proud to be part of this community of historians who I think in doing this work of telling the difficult stories, we are not saying that we shouldn't celebrate the promises of the nation. I think that's what it is. It's about promises. It's not about what has already been achieved or what was achieved at that time, but it's that there's language in place that was flexible enough and lofty enough for people, most famously African Americans, to use that same language and using the ideas that the founders put forth to fight for their own freedom. And I think that different minority communities have done that and are continuing to do that. And these are not just racially defined communities. We have the LGBTQ community to bring it into the present debates. We have a myriad of different groups who are using the language set in place for their own purposes. And I think that is one of the most important messages for me. So we've talked about who we should be remembering, commemorating and celebrating. And we've also talked about the dates that we'd like people to remember. So what about events? Are there specific events that you would like to see brought up in this conversation of what we'd like people to be thinking about in 2026? Ron? You know, I go for the underdog story, right? Earlier, I talked about the Art of the Confederation needing more love. There's another event that I think doesn't get a lot of play because it was a defeat for the Americans. And that was the Siege of Savannah in 1779. And the reason I find that event very important is because for one of the first times in American history, that battle is going to include some 500 free Black men from the colony of Saint-Domingue. And these Black men are going to be fighting for the rights of Americans. And so it was something that our country had not seen before. And the really interesting thing about that event is that you have Black men on the side of the Americans, but you also have Black men fighting on the side of the British. And those Black men in the midst of this American Revolution are fighting for their own freedom. The Black men for the British were promised freedom from slavery. And the Black men from San Domingue are trying to prove to the white French inhabitants of that island that they are just as equal. And so even though in America, we have the tendency to only talk about the victories. I think we learn a lot also from the defeats that we endure as well. I agree. I like the idea of telling different narratives, of talking about the people who don't come out on top or telling the alternative history through different means. I think that we need to also celebrate those moments of defeat where you learn different lessons. And we don't do that enough in our courses or in telling our own history. Lindsay, do you have any events you'd like us to remember? In our public imagination, and to Ron's point, I also love history movies and musicals and all of those things, but we should also be very clear, they are art. So they often require a little bit additional analysis. And one piece of that analysis is while Yorktown was sort of this incredibly pivotal moment for the war in that it forced the British to start thinking about peace negotiations, it didn't actually end the war. And that was, of course, the Treaty of Paris in 1783. And I think that moment is an essential one for us to have a better understanding of because it sets up so many of the shifting tides and the circumstances for the next, I would say, several centuries. It sets up the Western expansion. It sets up the growth of the slave trade. It sets up conflict between the United States and Great Britain and France in the future and naval rights. I mean, everything you can possibly imagine. And I also think it's a really great example of where you can use a couple of individuals to get at these broader things, because the outcome, I think, could have been quite different if you didn't have people like 
John Adams and John Jay, who were very distrusting of the French and were eager to have their own treaty and sort of sideline them, which they really weren't supposed to do. So they were kind of breaking the rules there. But that sets up a very different type of independence than could have been created if other people were present. And that allows us to explore these broader picture items and forces and movements that we've been discussing today in, I think, a really pivotal way. I wanted to also say that, and it goes back to the point that I made earlier about the United States continuing relationship to Europe and especially Great Britain. I think that the way I was taught, at least going to a public school in the United States, we are taught to think about the American Revolution as the moment in which Americans turned their back on Europe and on the old world and on old world aristocratic ways. And in fact, I think there's another way of looking at that, that in fact, especially the American elites, they wanted the freedom to live an aristocratic lifestyle that they could not have had they stayed in Europe. And I think this continues in as soon as Americans win the war, they are really concerned about retaining connections to European powers. And I think that's another strand that we don't talk about the losers. We also don't talk about this continuing dependence on the globe. And if you've been to Europe, the stereotype about Americans in the 20th and 21st century is that Americans are very ignorant of global politics and they are not good global citizens. And I think that is to our shame and our detriment because, in fact, when you look at the founding generation, when America was just starting or the United States was a young and struggling nation, we are anything but cut off from the world. We are the kid at the back of the room with their arms raised saying, please, please look at us. The newspapers are full of international events as opposed to what we see now in general. And I think that ignorance of the other is a luxury of the powerful. And so this only occurs in the United States, not because Americans are not interested in the globe, but after World War II, when we ascend to be a global force, that we somehow think we don't have to know what's going on. And I think now in the 21st century, we're seeing that that's not going to work anymore. And so that's another strand that I see or lesson from this period that we can carry into the present that I think is really important. And that is our engagement as global citizens. Speaking of lessons or strands, as I was listening to you give your different events and ideas that we should be thinking about in 2026, it occurred to me that one aspect of diplomatic history that we don't often think about is the United States' internal diplomacy. And this was really important. So I know we all know the Battle of Saratoga. It's a tried and true event. It's an event that everyone looks at. But there is a big story behind this famous story. So I'm thinking about how the New Englanders and the people of New York literally fought over who was going to profit most from supplying the army during the Saratoga campaign. And they also fought over who was going to command this army. Now, the United States almost lost Saratoga before it even became the battles of Saratoga because of this internal fighting and regional squabbling. And then to add to all of this, you do have these investigations into the command at Saratoga, into the supply chain problems, and all of these allegations that are going back and forth between the New Englanders and the New Yorkers, and this is distracting the Continental Congress from the war effort. So you have this regional squabbling in this one case that's impacting a continental wartime strategy. Additionally, another thing we really need to think about, because the Saratoga campaign in particular was this multi-pronged event, if you look at the Battle of Oriskany, which happens just before the battles at Saratoga, the pivotal battles at Saratoga might not have happened at all if it hadn't been for the bravery and prowess of the United Warriors at Oriskany. And we don't often think about the important roles that indigenous peoples played in revolutionary war battles on both sides. So these are really just some other ideas I think we should think about. Okay, now that we've had time to talk about the events, the people and dates that we should be remembering in 2026, what about legacies? Ron, I'm going to turn to you first because you're someone who loves to study the age of revolutions. So what about the legacies of the American Revolution? Should we be thinking about legacy when we talk about 2026? Yeah, the American Revolution was not an isolated event. I mean, we talk today about the connectedness of our world. The Atlantic world was connected then. Ships did not travel as fast as a tweet or as fast as our phones. But this U.S. push for freedom 
people around the Atlantic world were talking about it. They were learning about it, reading newspapers from Saint-Domingue, from St. Croix, across the Caribbean. People were following this and it inspired that effort on the North American continent, inspired others to begin to challenge imperial powers. And we're going to see that across 1776, 1783, 1804, 1825, into the middle of the 19th century. And I think, again, that's something that we should celebrate, the ways in which what happened in Boston, what happened in Philadelphia, what happened in Yorktown, really inspired people who we would consider very different, as Carrie Ann was saying earlier, like these others were paying attention and illustrated, yes, there are language differences, there are skin differences, there are differences in our ways of life, but there's a common desire to live in a freer way, to not accept what was as the only thing that could be. And I think that's a wonderful legacy of the American Revolution. And Carrie Ann talked about a promise out of the Declaration of Independence. And we all know this because we see Martin Luther King's speech every January. But in that famous speech, he calls the Declaration of Independence a promissory note. And I think the revolution continues to make promises that people across the world, not just Americans, continue to want to materialize. Picking off on that point, I think it's an excellent place. Liz, earlier you were talking about how the revolution is about power and Ron was talking about how he really likes to focus on the mistakes and when things go wrong. So in my work, I really see the revolution and particularly the declaration as the idea upon which this experiment was launched. And then the constitution is sort of the second act in which it's an attempt to form a more perfect union. And that embodies the concepts that you guys were talking about of who is going to have power, how is it going to be exercised? And that process is inherently going to be filled with mistake after mistake after mistake, because they start with the Articles of Confederation, and that goes kind of way too far in one direction. But they're trying not to go back towards the monarchy and have a full authoritarian system. And so they come up with the Constitution, which is a series of compromises and a hodgepodge of middle ground things that they're trying to piece together to make work and had zero expectation that what they had crafted would last as long as it did because they had just lived through this world in which things were constantly chaotic and changing and evolving. And so I think the legacy of this period is really that very idea that we are going to put forth these grand visions of what the American people and the world can be. And we're going to continue to try and meet those. And we're going to fail and we're going to fall short. And yet we're going to keep trying again and again. And I think the failure to keep trying to improve would be a grave disappointment. We obviously don't know what they really think because they're all dead. But if we could go back and talk to them, I think they would be so disappointed if we didn't keep trying to improve on that vision or come closer to that vision. And so to me, I think that's the legacy of what is worth celebrating about the revolution and what we should embrace going forward. I agree that that imperfection is something that was part of this American experiment from the beginning. And for me, the legacy, I read it every day in my classes. I have my students do an oral history of their family members if they're from an immigrant family or from friends. And I'm reading these oral histories of recent immigrants, some of whom are refugees, some of them who do not have legal status in the United States, but consider themselves as Americans and have been living and working and contributing to society here. And I'm reading this legacy of the Declaration of Independence and the founding documents in these immigrant stories, whether they fully realize it or not, it's what I see. I want so much for the work we do as historians to be seen as healing the nation rather than destroying the nation. And by setting higher standards or saying that we could do better, I think that's because we, in fact, love and care about the nation, care about this experiment. I don't want to bring in a parental metaphor, but I will. It's like when you're criticizing say, your children, it's not because you don't love them, it's because you know that they could do better and you want them to do better. And I hope that's the message that 
we as historians can give to our fellow citizens, not only in this podcast, but in the commemorations of 2026. We've talked a lot about the different ideas, people's events and legacies that we think we should be thinking about in 2026. But I know we also have our own wish lists as historians. So I wonder what else is on your wish list for 2026? What do you hope that your fellow Americans will be thinking about? Carrie Ann? I'd say that when I'm thinking about what I hope to see in the events that will take place, I'd like to see a variety of celebrations slash commemorations slash remembrances that are inclusive in a real sense. I want to have events that allow for the refugee, allow for the immigrant perspective. A lot of times, I think there is this dichotomy between full-fledged celebration and those who are left out. And I've been thinking a lot about the tenant that we have in our American legal system, which is innocent until proven guilty. And I've been thinking about that a lot. And I was thinking about the experiences of people of color in the United States. I've been working a lot with the Asian American community because we saw 300 plus fold increase in violence against Asian Americans, many of whom were citizens. And what struck me is that for people of color, people who are biologically defined as non-European, it's not innocent until proven guilty. It's not American until proven foreign. It's foreign until proven American. People who look different have to somehow prove that they belong. And I want us to have a more expansive and robust definition of who belongs in this American celebration and who belongs in this nation state. My wish list would be to have events that take this as an opportunity to reset, to reboot, so to speak, the American conversation about belonging and who is contributing to the nation state and embrace those who are part of this national conversation. What's on your wish list, Lindsay? Well, one of the things that I touched on earlier was this sense of how do you create a national identity when your national identity has been really shaped by your imperial relations. And that was such a multifaceted project. Everything from how do you dress as an American? How do you speak? How do you learn? How do you interact with your fellow Americans? How do you build emotional connections between one another, between states, between citizens and the federal government. And one of the ways in which that process began was the idea of trying to form civic participation and civic identity outside of this imperial project. And so there's been great work in Philadelphia. There were library societies, of course, by our patron name here, Ben Franklin, but also firemen groups and jockey clubs or people who had horses and all sorts of different forms of community that helped to establish those ties at a local and then a state and then a national level. And I think the study of building those emotional ties would be really instructive for our current moment when a lot of people are feeling sort of emotional tieless or are feeling a little bit disassociated, what with all of the things we've experienced in the last five years, the pandemic and lean online, but also as we're trying again to figure out what does it mean to be an American and how do we relate to one another? So I think better understanding how civic formation occurred and then maybe how we can apply some of those things to our lives would be a really good way to both honor the spirit of the revolution and apply it to our current moment. I do want to say here, the more we have talked about the revolution and Carrie Ann and Lindsay and Liz yourself have brought in all these different perspectives around it, some of which I had not thought of recently, I'm more excited about 2026. And I do hope your listeners will be as well. My wish list for that moment is kind of a three-pronged one. One, I want us to celebrate the evolution of freedom and its evolving meaning in the many groups in which it has encompassed since 1776. I want us to also acknowledge that not everyone enjoys equal freedom, that maybe the freedoms I enjoy, other people don't enjoy, and to commit ourselves as a community, as Americans, to continuing to open pathways so that more people can enjoy the freedoms that we do. As Lindsay said earlier, I don't want us to disappoint the founding generation's capacity to make mistakes 
because they tried to do better. So I've yet to make my travel plans for 4th of July 2026. And I'm thinking about how and where me and my family will be commemorating, remembering, and celebrating the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. So would you tell us where you and your family are thinking about going or maybe even doing as you think about and commemorate and celebrate July 4th, 2026? Lindsay, will you be headed to Philadelphia? I have been such a bad historian. There are so many sites that I have not seen. And it's not totally my fault because a lot of these things were closed for several years. I think the Museum of the American Revolution opened like right before lockdown. So I haven't been there. While I'm there, I haven't been to most of the battlefields in that area. And I know it can be kind of crusty and old, but I love battlefield history. So I think that that might be in order. First of all, I want to encourage all the listeners to go to battlefields, go to museums, go to historical societies. These places are just so wonderful. And the people who run them, the people who manage them, are wonderful and dedicated, and I want us all to go out and celebrate. Where I plan to go is Savannah, Georgia. I think it's a beautiful city. I don't think it gets enough love in conversations around the American Revolution. And I do want to be there in 2026. They've created a monument to the battalion of free Black men that came from San Domingue. I want to be there with my wife, with my children and the Savannah community to commemorate this really important event in American history. I have, over the years, found myself often in Great Britain on 4th of July. And I think it's really an interesting experience to be an American historian talking about the revolution and these dates in Great Britain. So I think it'd be really interesting to celebrate 2026 over there and get their perspective, especially because of the way I'm looking at these continuing relations between Great Britain and the U.S. That's one idea. And then I do travel. So stopping off at my hometown in Los Angeles, because I think that the West Coast really has a great opportunity to celebrate this moment and to think about where was California in 1776. And this is when the Spanish missions are being built. So I like the idea of alternate timelines and thinking about how the West Coast is also part of this larger American story. And as I said earlier, the American victory, the colonist victory in the revolution would have a great effect on people living in the West and in Mexico or what was then Alta California. So I want to do that and I want to bring in the Asian American community and the Japanese American National Museum, I'm hoping that maybe they'll be interested in putting on their own type of commemoration. So that would be my idea. Well, as I said, I have yet to make any plans. Tim and I may be here in Williamsburg, Virginia, taking in the festivities that I'm sure Colonial Williamsburg is going to have a lot of. But I may also go back home to Boston. And I've also been thinking a lot about the West. I did my graduate training in California, and I have wondered what the American Revolution would look like if we looked at it from west to east. You know, as you were saying, Carrie Ann, it's a very different history than the history along the East Coast, where the new United States was fighting for its independence. Spanish colonization in many ways was just getting started at that same period in California, and indigenous peoples still predominated in the West. It was still very much indigenous America in the West. So yeah, I've been thinking about what it would be like to experience 2026 from the West, And I suppose I can do that while also experiencing the 4th of July festivities here on the East Coast at Colonial Williamsburg. But I am going to keep my eyes out for unique experiences and opportunities. 2026, it's going to be a once in a lifetime moment. And as a historian and scholar of the American Revolution, I'm taking my decision very seriously. Carrie Ann Yakota, Lindsay Travinsky and Ronald Johnson, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your insights on how we historians have been thinking about 2026 and for the different ideas for what we might think about as this commemoration, remembrance, and celebration approaches. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Like Ron said, I'm now more excited than ever. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. The 250th anniversary of the American Revolution and the birth of the United States is a big occasion. And naturally, historians have been thinking about this big anniversary and reflecting upon all the research and work that has been done in our field of history so that we can see where we need to go with our research of the revolution and the revolutionary era. Lindsay, Ron, and Carrie Ann are very much a part of this reflection 
and the discussions of where historians think we should go. As you heard, 250 years later, historians of the American Revolution still can't agree on a definition of what the revolution was as an event. As Lindsay so aptly stated, if you ask 100 historians about how they define the American Revolution, you will get at least 105 different answers. And a large part of the reason for this is that the American Revolution wasn't just one event. It was a series of events, movements, and ideas. The revolution was such a complex event that not even the founding generation who created and lived through the revolution could agree on a single definition or cause of the American Revolution. So when historians meet, they still discuss and debate the origins of the American Revolution and how we should view the event. They also debate the periodization of the revolution. Now, in my experience, most historians agree within a year or two that the American Revolution began in 1763 after the signing of the Treaty of Paris of 1763, which ended the Seven Years or French and Indian War. Where there is much more disagreement is the year that marks the end of the American Revolution. Some scholars believe that the end of the revolution came in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris of 1783, which formally ended the War for Independence and in which treaty Great Britain acknowledged the United States as an independent nation. But other scholars believe that the revolution carried on longer into the 1780s when the Constitution was created in 1787 and ratified in 1789. And still other scholars believe that to understand the full scope of the American Revolution, you must look back on the history of the revolution from an end date in 1812. And given that historians can't agree on a definition of the American Revolution or its exact start and end dates, you probably aren't surprised by the fact that historians are debating which events and people they would like to see addressed and highlighted during the United States' semi-quincentennial in 2026. As Ron, Carrie Ann, and Lindsay highlighted, most historians agree that the 250th anniversary should be an inclusive event. Historians who want an inclusive story of the American Revolution argue that by telling the history of the revolution that reflects the contributions of people across economic and social classes, as well as across racial and ethnic lines, that this telling allows us to see the American Revolution for what it truly was, a diverse and multifaceted event where so many different people, Americans, foreigners, and the enslaved, contributed. Still, there are some historians who worry about what adding the deeds and contributions of people who were not the founding fathers will do to the narrative of the American Revolution. These scholars worry whether there will be space for the traditional events and founding father figures we've all learned about in grade school. Now, as I leave you to think through our conversation and the different debates and conversations historians are having, one aspect of our conversation that I'd like you to remember is that no matter what conclusions you come to, 2026 will be a time for commemoration, remembrance, and celebration. As Ron noted, the ideas and ideals that came from the American Revolution are ideas and ideals that each generation of Americans has thought about, interpreted, and innovated upon for themselves. 2026 will be our time to commemorate the founding of the United States, remember and celebrate those who fought for our independence and the freedom and equality we enjoy, and to assess, as a nation, whether we have reached the levels of freedom and equality we think are possible. Look for more information about Lindsay, Ron, and Carrie Ann and their work, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 361. On the show notes page, you'll also find links to the special Thomas Jefferson and Frederick Douglass video, Holly's blog post, and teacher materials. Again, you'll find these links at benfranklinsworld.com slash three, six, one. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends about it. After all, friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, Joseph Edelman, Holly White, Taylor Fisher, and Ian Tonat. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, when do you think the American Revolution ended? Personally, I'm a scholar of the Long Revolution, so I look to end the revolution around 1800, which is the first peaceful transfer of power between two different political parties. You had a transfer of power between John Adams's Federalist Party to Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party. So that's what I think, but what do you think? Let me know. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.